Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph McHale, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. And today I'm going to give you a video that really overviews all that happened at ASH this year in multiple myeloma. It was a remarkable year at ASH with over a thousand abstracts dedicated to multiple myeloma. It's impossible in less than 10 minutes to give them all uh, the, the credence that they require and due diligence, but I'm just going to give you an overview of major themes and concepts that emerged from ASH 2022 um, and what implications it has for our future research and indeed for our clinical practice. To make it simple, I've narrowed it down to seven major areas of interest. Area number one, by specifics. Indeed, we could call this the ASH of bispecifics, bispecifics, bispecifics. So these are bispecific antibodies that have one arm that adhere to the myeloma cell and another arm that adheres to a local uh, engaging cell, typically a T cell, although there is some interesting work going on in natural killer cells as well. And perhaps topping the list of all the abstracts was the talquetamab bispecific antibody. This was of interest because it's now not just hooking onto the myeloma cell, but instead of the previous bispecifics that seem to focus on BCMA or B cell maturation antigen, it has a new target of GPRC5D. And with that, we saw a really impressive response rates, over 70% response rates, but we do see a bit of a different toxicity profile. We see a uh, dyskesia or change in taste, effect of skin, nail, and hair, uh, and then perhaps a little less infections than we saw with the BCMA directed uh, by specifics. That being said, we had several other by specifics that were also in development. We had uh, linvoseltamab uh, from Regeneron. There were several abstracts on elranatumab, uh, which may be the next BCMA directed uh, by specific to be approved, uh, and really several others. Um, not only that, we saw one looking at yet a third target, so not BCMA, not GPRC5D, but FCRH5 in the form of sevastamab. And interestingly, we saw some good work of using tocilizumab to reduce the cytokine release syndrome uh, that we see with bispecifics, which I think is going to be very important in the long term to be able to uh, provide these more easily in the clinic. Lots more to say about bispecifics, but generally speaking, we're seeing they, uh, now that we have them in the clinic in the form of teclistamab, we're going to see them uh, likely with a reduced CRS and even reduced infections as we get to use these more fully. And several are development over 12. We'll likely see another two approved in this calendar year. Major area number two, CAR T-cell therapy, or what I might call CAR T-cell therapy 202. And what do I mean by that is we're really seeing advances in CAR T-cell therapy. We saw already now we have two products, Idacel and Siltacel in the clinic. Well, now we're seeing further developments with those products and more. So multiple things are coming, such as using these two products earlier in the disease course. Right now, they have to be used in patients with at least four prior lines of therapy. But we saw interesting work with both of these therapies being used much earlier in the disease course with one to three prior lines or in patients with particular high-risk disease. But not only so, we're seeing other CAR-Ts develop, looking at different targets instead of just BCMA, just like we saw with biospecifics, targeting GPRC5D. We've seen enhancements in the manufacturing process to make it go quicker, or what must some people have called fast cars, where the manufacturing process doesn't take four, six, seven weeks, like now we're waiting for our products for our patients, or ones that are going to allow the product to last longer, where those, if you will, uh, that these cars can drive for longer and not run out of gas, so the T-cells can be constantly engaged. So I really think we're seeing this second wave of improvements to car T-cell therapy, which will likely also make their way into the clinic before too long. Number Area number three was in the precursor conditions of myeloma, namely in MGUS. Tremendous work from the Iceland study that the IMF has a privilege, been a privilege to be a part of, where we're starting to understand the incidence of MGUS better and how it's actually not associated with certain conditions as we uh, thought before in terms of other inflammatory or uh, cardiac or renal conditions. Uh, but we're learning much more about uh, how important it is to follow these patients and indeed how they can transform into Active myeloma, which brings me to area number four, which is smoldering multiple myeloma. And we saw that this is an evolving field. You know, the spectrum between MGUS to smoldering to active myeloma is not a simple dynamic. Some patients sadly fly right through it. Others will never progress through it. So the more we can understand 
uh, the better. We've already taken part of what used to be called ultra high risk smoldering myeloma and have now made it part of active myeloma and we went from crab to slim crab. Well, now we're looking at patients that still have smoldering disease but have higher risk features. Uh, and one of our Black Swan Research Initiative trials, the ASCENT trial that Dr. Kumar led, was specifically looking at taking those higher risk smoldering patients and treating them very aggressively with quadruplet therapies, treating them with stem cell transplant. We saw extraordinary response rates, and time is going to tell us if we can, in that subset of people, by intervening earlier, not only prevent their active myeloma, but possibly uh, even give them a very prolonged remission by virtue of intervening earlier in the disease course. So lots of other work going on in uh, understanding smoldering myeloma and when to treat and when not to treat. This is a big issue in the clinic because we don't want to treat people too early who may never develop myeloma, but we never want to wait too late until the disease has already progressed and perhaps not as easily control. So that was area number four. Uh, area number five was mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry is a fascinating tool that can be used in multiple ways, but primarily in detecting the monoclonal protein of multiple myeloma. We know that historically, we've always used the serum protein electrophoresis with immunofixation and serum-free light chain assay, and that's been critical in detecting and monitoring myeloma, but there are a lot of challenges with that. There are multiple different tests. Sometimes they're not always easily measured. If a patient has an IgA monoclonal protein, it may not be easily captured in the beta region. Some people have light chain only disease. So there's growing work looking at using mass spec, which right down to the Dalton can tell us the size of the monoclonal protein and indeed distinguish it from treatments people may, may be having with drugs like daratumumab and esotuximab. And of course, we can use the same technology in mass spec, even potentially to monitor and look for minimal residual disease, uh, which really was another great theme of this meeting and looking at minimal, uh, minimal residual disease and how it may be used to either stop therapy or at least de-escalate therapy. So we've talked about biospecifics, we've talked about CAR-T, we've talked about MGUS, we've talked about smoldering myeloma, mass spectrometry. That leaves me with two more topics to round out our video today. The next is on newer novel agents. And although we get very excited and appropriately so about being able to use CAR-T cell therapies and biospecifics, we still want easily delivered uh, and readily available drugs in the clinic, which include the next generation cell mods, as we call them, or kind of like the next generation immunomodulatory drugs, a lot like lenalidomide and pomalidomide. And we saw data this year for iberdamide and nizigdamide. And both of these drugs are really proving themselves as an oral, easily tolerated drug that uh, can be um, uh, taken by itself or in combination that is already proving that it has a significant response rate, typically over 30 or 40 percent, even in patients who are pomalidomide resistant. The third novel drug is called Modaca-FUSP, which is uh, kind of something old, something new. It's bringing back interferon, believe it or not, but bringing it back in a very interesting delivery mechanism uh, with an antibody that targets CD38 so that patients don't have the toxicities we used to see with interferon. But again, proving itself, even in patients that have had BCMA-directed therapies like bispecifics, or CAR T-cell therapy uh, to have activity. So more about ibertamide, mesigdamide, and uh, modacafusp in the near future, but these are drugs that we're likely going to see in the not-so-distant future that uh, are more easily delivered in the clinic. Last but not least, and indeed we're going to have a whole video dedicated to this topic, but I can't help in an ASH overview to comment on health disparities in multiple myeloma. We had really no less than 30 abstracts dedicated to this really important topic. And as a teaser, I want you to be able to watch the video that we've done on health disparities dedicated to it. But what we're learning is that there's still a tremendous disparity in multiple myeloma based on race, race, ethnicity, and multiple other factors, socioeconomic factors and others. We know that myeloma is twice, in com twice as common in the African-American population and yet has literally half the survival. But lots of research is going on to reduce that gap, to understand the disparity better. And even with some of these novel therapies, looking at uh, how certain race and ethnicities may have more cytokine release syndrome or longer hospitalizations or better response or inferior response to different treatments. These are the things that we need to understand better so we can treat every patient effectively with myeloma. It was a tremendous year at ASH. And I hope uh, that this helps you navigate some of the incredible things that are happening in multiple myeloma. Thank you very much.